This is episode 67 of the Gauntlet Podcast. My name is Jason. My name is Tim. I'm Andrea. And I'm Rich. Awesome. Hey, Rich, we've covered masks pretty extensively on the show, but I gather you're in a game right now that's going pretty well. I am, and, and I know that everyone is maybe possibly a little tired of masks, but the book has been released to Kickstarter backers, and along with the book, there were several playbooks that are considered in playtest. Yona has not been playing with this Intercontinental Group of Awesome, so in our 10th session, which is pretty far along. I mean, for a Power by the Apocalypse game, we've gotten a lot of mileage that's a out lot, of this. Yeah. Yeah. And that's all the same group, the Masks High School game. She brought in the Innocent, and Andrea was not able to play with us, which is like bad, sad, but amazing, awesome, because what you're going to step back into is a huge landmine, minefield craziness. It's so, so good, Andrea. So good. Uh, the, the Innocent turned out to be maybe the perfect playbook to bring into an ongoing game. Because the idea behind the innocent, for anyone who reads Marvel comics, is basically a young Cyclops. For everyone else in the world, which is the majority, it is a young hero who has been thrust forward in time and has found out that as an adult, they became a supervillain. And okay, so that's the concept. What's neat about it is that the playbook is not about I'm going to go back in time or any of that kind of stuff. It is really about how do you deal with who you are now? How do you keep yourself from going down that path? What was the path? And what are you going to do about your adult self? There are some really neat ideas within it as you take the steps towards becoming villainous. You know, if you make those bad choices, it can actually change how basic moves work for your character. I, I find that really fascinating. We we didn't explore that. It was mostly how is this character going to be introduced to the group and how she navigated the horrible awfulness that is her adult self. And it, it turned out to be a great game session. A lot of payoffs for previous uh, – th- th- we hadn't played since May, but I went and kind of – mainlined all five of the the most five recent game sessions and brought up a whole lot of dangling plot threads so i was kind of happy that i had a little bit of time to do that but that innocent playbook is it's hot it's really really good i like it a lot Awesome, cool. Yeah, I still haven't played. Well, no, I played like one session. I guess I've played Masks. <laughs> you did or maybe two. I don't know. It hasn't been that many. Yeah, you, um, you just I played a couple on the Saturday morning cartoons. Yeah, so no. yeah. I haven't run Masks yet, which is that's the thing I like to do in a Powered by the Apocalypse game. I like to run it through its paces and see if I can like manage all the all the different moves it should be firing and and all that stuff and. I like to be able to like look at it like in its totality and like see what I think about the system in that way. You know? Sure. My biggest problem is I'm just not super into the theme. It's just a thing that does not get me excited. Um, so I have to kind of get past that, I guess. But As as a guy who used to read X-Men, I'm kind of surprised that it doesn't kind of hit you. I think it's just, I don't know what it is. I think I am more, I think I'm more just into like, 80s and 90s era comic book stories you know and maybe not so much like the teenage comic books like the teenager angle i think i think that's the part that's not really like working for me like when i think about that so my approach is teenage because i said it in high school but the default setting is actually young adult uh brendan was pretty specific about that in that he really didn't want to make a monster hearts with capes he wanted mm-hmm. to have a young adult type setting. I just happen to prefer the X Men Mutant Academy hero high school type deal. So that's yeah, that's yeah. that's what I end up talking about because that's what I've chosen uh, yeah, to set. Yeah. Well, and also I, it's probably worth pointing out that a lot of my interest in the X Men, especially like when I was growing up, was it's a huge, huge metaphor for like being gay, right? Mm-hmm. Like right. it's a massive metaphor for that. So that was a lot of my like uh my attraction to it. And also I just thought that I thought the women characters, at least for the time, were really, really like strong and cool, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um so there were lots of like there were those kinds of reasons too, which is why I think when I was younger it appealed to me more. But um it's no knock against the game. I just um it's just the one the one hurdle I have to like putting it on my calendar it's like right uh, just yeah well if it makes you feel better um i know you've played it a couple of times 
but the actual theme of the game kind of sneaks up on you. Like, most people look at it and they're like, oh, it's about young superheroes. But the actual theme of the game is finding out who you are and who you want to yeah. be in spite of other people mm. telling you something different. And that's really cool to play out. Yeah, no, no. I, I, it, I think everything I hear about it, my brain says, yeah, I want to. That sounds cool. I want to do that. That sounds really awesome. I think it's just... um. I think it's just like there's just like a little a little hurdle I need to get over, you know. Also, it's super popular right now, and I just have this like, <laughs> I just have this contrary in spirit. I knew it. Like, I knew it. <laughs> it's a lot of it too. Like I want to play it like in three years when no one cares about it anymore. So, um, <laughs> I want to run it then. That is amazing. No, that's cool. A forward-looking hipster. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rich, is there anything else you want to talk about? I, I, I'm just so happy to be back on the horse. I can't wait till we do some cosmic stuff in two game sessions, one or two com- uh, game sessions. Going to be crazy cool, cosmic cool. spaceships a flying because that's what you can do in superheroes. Awesome, awesome. We'll look forward to see how it goes. Uh, Tim, how's your Apocalypse World Second Edition game going? Yeah, it's going pretty well. So the game that needs no introduction. Um, this is going on with the Gauntlet Portland meetup. I don't really need to talk about the game itself. I mean, been there. Um, but something that I thought would be uh, interesting material just to bring up is the idea of when you're running a game, especially in a meetup setting, but I think this applies elsewhere, the flexibility of trying to run good sessions when you have new players jumping in or missing players that you thought were going to be there. Anyone who's done meetup is familiar with this, but it's a good skill kind of rolling with those punches, even if yeah. you have a... Um, you know, a super steady group or say you're doing convention play or something like that. And it's just, um, I had that happen with the last session. We had some really, you know, tight character interactions that were totally different because of a missing player and a new player. Um, And it went pretty well. Um, Some of the things that we did to help it in this context was to hit, well, actually, first of all, I tried not to end episodes on cliffhangers that need to pick right back up afterward because i find the more encapsulated the sessions are the easier it is to possibly pick up a different thread next time if needed and that helps that's really player. smart actually that's good yeah 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 i mean when i'm doing things right otherwise i don't look at the clock so so often that doesn't happen <laughs> with new players um hitting the history really hard the connections between the characters because one way to think of it is you're essentially retconning like think of the tv show or comic or whatever where they did that retcon that kind of made you cringe of like oh it's your sister that we forgot to talk about we didn't Um, talk about last time right right (laughs) right and so you you really want to spend some time on that and make it work and make it sing um because those characters you know have to have reason to be together even though someone is new to the table And then beyond that, the last thing was just really spotlighting the new player, whether they're new to a group or to a game or to gaming in general. Just like make them remember this, um, like really shine that light on them, highlight their actions, set them up for good stuff. Um, And with those other players, even if you've only had one session with them, you can lean on them to help spotlight this new person too. Like, Like everyone can contribute to really make it a memorable session for a new person and that worked out well and yeah it that's out. super sharp i um as you know this is how the gauntlet's been running games for you know for a while now and it's definitely a skill that is worth uh honing especially if you have desires to like really like you know expand the number of people who you invite to your table uh you know really broaden your you know your pool of players like it's helpful to be flexible in that way I like what you said about spotlighting the new character. I think it goes in reverse, too. We're going to talk about it a little bit later. But, you know, I had Rich for one session of Monster of the Week the other day. And, you know, I had I can't say I'd ever really done that before, where I was like, okay, I've got him for one session, so I'm going to make sure that we really get his story in there, you know? Um, but I made, like, you know, the table made a conscious effort to do that, and it, it worked really well. So I think... There's really something to be said about like looking at your schedule and who might be there and who might not be there and and maybe like nudging and and massaging the story in certain ways. So that's cool. It's really cool. Yeah. It's it's a very directorial stance. I mean, on the one end you're looking at rules and mechanics yada yada, but there's that ability to just step back and look at this greater arc and the yeah. clock and the player dynamics and and yeah, try to force that along. So 
So yeah, that was one um, thing I encountered with that ongoing Apocalypse World session. The, the last note on t- with that in terms of what I'm working on is the new character. She's playing a brainer. The brainer is the creepy, mind controlly wizard, <laughs> for lack of right, a better word. Yeah. <laughs> um, and she's playing her pretty nice. Like, um, I don't know. It, it seems like brainers. They have access to a lot of... I think we're all very skeptical. I'm just going to throw that out there. <laughs> <laughs> they, they, just... Well, at the very least, I was, I was going to tie this around. Like, like, at the very least, even if they're not you know, a mean brainer, they're a flawed character with a troubled past. And so they, they do bad shit. I mean, Jason, I don't yeah, know if you can yeah. speak to that at all in, in, in a gaming time where you had a brainer who was... <laughs> oh yeah, I for, I forgot you were in that game with us, Tim. I was like, I was like, I should tell him about my brainer, but then I was like, oh yeah, you know about my brainer. Um, and so the way I've been playing that is every time she interacts with someone to give her access to some sort of dirty secret about them that is new to the table. Whether it's that this kid she's trying to get to an errand, like he's stealing food from, that's supposed to go to the families and, and you know, he doesn't sleep at night because of it. Or the hard holder's spouse who she finds out is sleeping with, you know, his wife's twin. Um, she's finding out these, <laughs> secret, <laughs> these secrets left and right because at a certain point she will be armed with the abilities and have the ammunition of these secrets to do something with it. And I'm, it's kind of a slow game of setting her up for that. And I think it will pay off. So she's playing a nice brainer who's done nice things. And she's not seen a nice side of anyone just because she sees beyond this veil of everyone else. And I'm curious to see how that pays off. Cool. Yes. Is there anything else you want to say about Apocalypse World? No, edition? I am right, good. Cool. Thank you. I, I'm excited that you're getting to play that. I um. I don't get to play Apocalypse World. Ironically, I don't get to play it that much. I would like to play it more. But the last year or so, I've been waiting on the new edition, basically. Andrea, what's Necessary Evil? Necessary Evil is pretty much Suicide Squad. Not going to lie, the okay. trailer <laughs> made us real excited. <laughs> so it's a Savage World setting in which aliens invaded the Earth and they wiped out all the good guys. So the only ones left to defend it are the bad guys. Which is adorable. And what I really love about it, which I'm, I, I love this about every superhero movie, is when everyone starts bickering and arguing about how their way is the best way. And that's even more prevalent when it's a bunch of bad guys. It's actually something I missed in the Suicide Squad movie. Spoilers. But like we, I loved the scenes where we just, it was just us basically arguing with each other just to argue because we're a bunch of loners. We're used to working by ourselves and not having teams to rely on. So suddenly having to become a team, it's a whole new learning curve. And that was a lot of fun to explore. Cool. I do think I kind of wrecked it, though, a little bit. Yes! Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, our GM was like, okay, guys, this is a really like grim, dark, serious, gritty game. And we're like, okay, yeah, we can do that. And then Andrea, stupid Andrea, is like, well, I'm going to play the Brick character. And you know how in superhero movies, like, the Brick bad guy is always just really stupid? (laughs) So that was me. (laughs) And I think I ruined it a little bit. Like, everyone had fun, but I definitely totally crashed the atmosphere. Um, I was Mm. playing a, like, her name was Blindside. She was an evil rugby player that had done steroids. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And like, she got into the teamwork thing because she was really excited. She's like, this is so cool. I haven't had a team since I stole the championship trophy after my team kicked me out for doing steroids. This is awesome. <laughs> and she was always like trying to buy people hamburgers and by buy, what I mean is she would steal a purse and then use that purse to pay in front of the person she stole the purse from. So I think I think I maybe wrecked the tone a yeah, little bit. Yeah, you may have wrecked it. Yeah. <laughs> but it, it was yeah. a very entertaining game, and the next time we play it, I'm definitely going to try to rein myself in a little more. I just, I really love goofy, over-the-top superheroes and villains so much. Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, we've never covered Savage Worlds on the show, oh. but um, I have to imagine most people know what it is and how it works, because yeah. it's been around the way for a while. It's fast, okay. furious, and fun. 
It's is something. that what they say about Savage Worlds? <laughs> it is. Yeah. All I know is it has riffs now, so it's already gone up in my book. Yeah. Um, Interestingly, apparently somebody did math. It wasn't me because I don't math. Somebody did math and found out you actually have a better chance to succeed with your lower skills than if you actually sink a lot of points into them. Hmm. That Which makes me really sad for the me. system. Yeah. It's because yeah. they have expl- <laughs> it's exploding dice. I think is one of the biggest reasons, yeah. and and D fours explode pretty yeah. easily twenty five percent of the time, right? Yeah. yeah, like you're always trying to get like an, like a target numbers of like eights, eights four, eight four, eight, twelve, that sort of thing. So. I've only I've only played Savage Worlds once. It was once like four years ago or something. And the one thing I remember liking about it was the initiative system. Um the way it, I don't know if these if it, I don't know if we were doing like a hack or what. I don't know, but like you used like playing cards to yep. do the initiative. Is that yep. how it works? Okay. Yep. Yep. I thought that was pretty cool. I was like, oh this is cool. I'm yeah, it's done some yeah. cool stuff with combining cards and dice and like the Deadland setting, the like weird west weird wild west setting, like if you are playing a, um, oh my gosh, I can't remember the name of it, but basically the magic dudes, you use cards for those because Huckster? it's like the game. Huckster, thank you. It's like the gambler and you have your little hand of cards you're playing out of. And so they've done some cool stuff thematically and Savage Worlds has some of the best settings, hands down. I love Savage Worlds settings because there are so many of them and there are so many different creative people working on them. I'm just, you know, prefer lighter systems i guess yeah yeah. and i can't, apparently um, can't do grimdark <laughs> <laughs> yeah i love that you you love tension but then you made a goofball good job andrea sorry i should way not to, have way to bring brick. about the thing you want to happen in the game i know i'm sorry <laughs> i like i like savage worlds i ran a shine tar uh which is a fantasy high fantasy setting i ran a shine tar campaign for a little over a year it was my last local group uh, before I moved to pretty much all hangout. One of the highlights of the game was a simple skeleton. Uh, so again, I said, you know, when you roll max on a die, it explodes and you roll it again. A simple skeleton uh, obliterated one of the characters like and exploded five, like five times. And that guy was dead. Oh, but the GM rolls dice too. Yep. Because the, oh, yeah, okay. this is That's one of those role playing games where the GM has to roll dice. And I exploded all over. Yeah, it, it just seems it seems so foreign at this point. It's just like, oh, what? <laughs> oh, you, <laughs> you gotta work on stat blocks. You gotta oh, is movement rules. Yeah. The character sheets stuff. like four pages. Oh yeah. <laughs> awesome, awesome. Was there anything else you want to say about necessary evil? That that pretty much covers it. Okay, cool. Well, I got to run Dungeon World again. We did a kickoff of a four-session run of Dungeon World um, using my Death Frost Doom adaptation, my adaptation of the Death, Death Frost Doom module, which you can go look at, uh, listeners. If you just scroll around the G Plus page, you can find the link where I have all my notes there if you want to go check it out. Um, it will be done by the time this goes out, so go take a look at that if you're interested and see how I did it. Um, it was great fun. I was. It was a really, really good session. I have to say, over the last like mm, six months or so, I've been really refining like my first session process, my first session procedure in Dungeon World, um, and I'm really happy with it right now. I've got it to where we spend the entire session basically learning about the characters, but still moving the adventure forward right we're not doing a bunch of like aimless wandering like you would in like say monster hearts or something like that right it's a they're they're on their way somewhere they're going to the dungeon but um but i have like these sets of questions and these procedures in place that help really really flesh out like the dynamics between the characters their relationship to the world um, the environment itself and uh, i'm really happy with it like it really came out nicely in this one and um that's all I've got to say about it. I've talked about this a lot on Discern Realities, so I'm not going to you know, belabor it here. But really, really great session. We had a brand new player who I'd never played with before, and he had a great time. So that always makes me feel good. Yeah, it was good. Good stuff. Cool. And another game I kicked off this past week was Monster of the Week um, in my 1980s uh, style of doing Monster of the Week. Rich, you played in that one. Um, we mentioned it just a second ago about how you just had one session with us. But I'm curious how you thought it went. 
It was super fun. It was definitely an 80s pastiche homage kind of thing. And I love that you led off with that. Like, hey, guys, this is where we're going. Let's make sure we kind of play into that. And the entire group was totally bought in. Everyone um, hit it. Yeah, they hit it really well. I thought I was I was really proud of the whole table. It was well, as a GM, it was very enjoyable to watch. Like I was having a lot of fun with it. Yeah. Uh, I've talked about this before, but I do this like two session, uh, big trouble in little China scenario, uh, often, often when I kick off monster of the week with a new group. And, um, this was probably the most fun first session of it I've done so far. And I've, I've run this a bunch, but I really liked what you guys did with this one. Me too. I really, uh, super enjoyed being able to face off with earthquake. One of the major bad guys from big trouble in little China. It was great. (laughs) <laughs> well, he wasn't, he wasn't an earthquake in Big Trouble in Little China. I actually took, so Big Trouble in Little China, the movie has those three gods. Right. Um, the three storms, are, right? The three storms, but I changed the storms, uh, to three different storms. So I there's see. fire, earthquake, and I, can, I haven't, I'm not going to say what the third one is, but, um, oh, okay. uh, whereas the movie has like lightning, thunder, and something else. But, uh, yeah. So just a small adjustment to avoid. <laughs> Copyright. <laughs> well, it was, it was played by Bolo Young, and that's all I cared about. It was played by yes, Bolo, was. and that's yes. what I needed to know. Uh, so what I did, knowing that I only had, because this was the gap between, for Gen Con, I did not run Lady Blackbird this past weekend. I saw that you had a space open for Monster Week, which blew my mind. I'm thinking probably because it was Gen Con, because usually your slots are totally full. Right, yeah. And I thought, well, I've got a one shot. I, I'm going to jump in. Also, Monster of the Week is on my ladder of insanity, so why not? I, I'm I'm here to support your 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 madness. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I appreciate for that. You. <laughs> I have hit rung eight. Update on ladder of insanity. I've hit rung eight. Thank you. And so I played a wronged, and uh, you were very helpful in saying, "Hey, you're main because the wronged has a particular baddie that they are." totally keyed in on that is the thing that they fight and he said you should probably make it evil spirits or ghosts so i tied that into the character backstory and and the wrong already you choose someone that you've lost and one of the things that i was really happy with in that session was, of course you were really generous in giving me the opportunity hey let's tell this guy's story because we only get this one glimpse of it right, yeah. but i especially like that we ended it in his apartment and you know, just that scene like, was so good. Ugh, that scene it, was it, that scene was fucking magic. It was so good. Thank you, thank you. It was it was really good because you said uh, you started off. You said okay when you come into the apartment, and I thought this was this is a GM trick that I've really enjoyed. You instead of saying hey Rich, tell us the story of your character's life, you pointed to JD and you said, tell me one thing about this apartment that you notice that tells you that Jeff, my character, that Jeff has gone through a great deal of loss. Right. You know, and that was, that was really tight because they were immediately bought in. So it wasn't, Hey, Rich is going to describe box text of some room he's making up. And, and so you did that with both characters and I thought their reactions were awesome. And I, I love that we were able to mix in, uh, the kind of character that he, his life kind of, his real life stopped at a certain point when that loss happened. And then there are these other newer things that are absolutely not who he should be. <laughs> like, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so those, those aspects of being able to show that duality within inanimate objects to tell that story and some of the little things that we could bring in, like, Oh, uh, this person's wounded. All right. Then Jeff's going to go to the refrigerator and he opens it up. And one of the things you see is that he, he's got a, a, cake topper with the number nine and that was like from his daughter's that was, that was so good yeah, last yeah, birthday yeah. you know and he moves it aside he, he kept, pulls some he ice the cake and all that yeah oh yeah it was so good it was so good and so there are a lot of those little images that we were able to play to and it, you know sure i was a little heavy-handed with with hammering at home but you know that it was the first, trope too exactly yeah. exactly yeah, it was, yeah. we bought into it and so it really paid off well and like I, in the 1980s movie that's how it would go like you they'd be hitting you with a sledgehammer with that like imagery of like showing your loss like nonstop, right like it would be a thing so and, and why I not go for it, it right you know yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's kind of your thing about 
sorry, Tim, but your thing about, you know, dwarves should have Scottish accents, just like buy into that because that can be a vehicle to help tell the kind of story you want to do with this version. So I really enjoyed that. Yeah. You know, that thing I did where, um, you know, instead of asking you to describe your apartment or I I did eventually, but, but, but I kind of started with the other players and had them you know, answer the question, what do you see here that makes you know that this is a place of loss? You know, um, that's something that I, uh, I did my death frost doom game too. It's, it's a, it's a technique that I've been like really, really like playing with a lot lately. And I'm very happy with it. It's, it's not about like me as the GM describing things. Um, and also I'm lazy, so it's great to get the players involved, but it's not about me describing things. It's about like getting other players invested in describing things, you know, and, um, you know, so you pick up on the theme that you want the players to experience and you say, tell me how you know this is a dead place. Tell me how you know that this is a place of, you know, resplendence or opulence, that kind of thing. Um, it just creates a nice group buy-in. It's awesome. Not only does it create buy-in, and I'm sorry if I'm harping on it, but I've, I was just really turned on. It's like my favorite trick of the game. It, it creates buy-in, but it also allows the player to even express their character's point of view and how they answer it, you know. My character's super perceptive, so I pick up this little clue. Or my character's very engaged in this part of the world, and so I notice this thing is out of place. So it's it's a great two-way street of being able to set the mood that you want, but allowing the player to do it from not having to step into that, as you said, you know, a director stance, Tim. You can stay in character and answer it. And that's I think that's really tight. It was something that I'm, I'm noticing a lot more is phrasing it around oh so a player can stay in character and still answer it yeah 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 cool well it was a great session i um i was really happy with it i've been super tempted to ask the players if they don't mind if i release the video because i was really happy with it like it it was it was it it felt like everybody was just really hitting their marks you know and i and and it and the the mechanics were coming through great like it was just a good session so yeah oh man last moment so the the we do the Big trouble thing. And Yoshi, of course, is playing like this slightly clueless person who ends up going, stumbling right into the main bad guy. And there was a, a, a moment as he's talking and, and you look to Yoshi and you, and you go, is it okay if you have green eyes? And he's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that moment. Uh, yes, of course, my character has green eyes. Cool. Well, uh, is there anything else you want to talk about? I don't know. I've like gushed enough. It. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I like to be gushed. I like for my games that I run to be gushed over. So, um, I'm glad, I'm glad you had a good time. Uh, Tim, how's Beyond the Wall going? Yeah, it's going pretty well. So, uh, Pocket Size Play is doing a short fantasy campaign. Um, I'm running this system called Beyond the Wall. It's a low fantasy, low prep kind of OSR game published by Flatline Games. So uh, listeners can check out episode 66, hear a little bit more about what we're doing with that. But we had a few sessions, and on that third session yesterday, I rolled a saving throw, and <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> <laughs> you turned around on saving throws. <laughs> yeah. And I was really tempted for I rolled a saving throw, and I liked it. I was tempted to sing that, like a la Katy Perry, but Cordova's been killing it with the singing lately. <laughs> um so, so that was just an interesting moment. I mean, something I've been mulling on with that system is how authority is distributed. Um, again, comparing kind of some story games, no SR games, uh, a lot of story games seem to really clearly tell me if there's a GM, she can do this things. Uh, if, if there's a player, if they're players, they can do these things. There's some shared authority, but some things are separate. And um, an OSR game like this, it focuses a lot more on the mechanics of how things work, but the authority is not so clear of, okay, well, whose responsibility is it to push this ahead or do this? And when I'm rolling a saving throw, just like the players do, we're both rolling die yeah, in these yeah. similar situations. It's it's weird. It's different. But I kind of like being one of the normal people and, and <laughs> rolling a saving throw, one of the normies. So, yeah. <laughs> what was it against? Um, so Rough it was saving throw ver- versus spell, um, okay, right. per- particularly um, terrifying presence was the spell. I was a nymph, as as I'm sure everyone assumed I already was, and I resisted the shit out of that and just just stared him down and said, "Nope." So, what does your nymph do in response? Like, just 
Um, they were there to steal shit, and she stole a crystal from a character and ran through a wall. <laughs> so okay. it was pretty fun. <laughs> awesome. Um, now, so your, yeah. note, your notes say you're doing a low fantasy thing. That doesn't sound very low fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, were, we were channeling the, the Miyazaki very strong in the last one, and so forest spirits were a thing. Got and it. Try okay. to, kind so of it's playing just on in the, the forest, then. There we go. Okay. Yeah, and these nature themes <laughs> we're working on. But, but yeah. Um, Wah, wah. So, um, <laughs> so continuing um, that thread a bit in terms of what I'm working on, again, that idea of authority. So uh, games, uh, so anyone who's played uh, Powered by the Apocalypse, anyone who's played a long running campaign knows that events tend to snowball and loose threads tend to pile up. And you just get more and more and more going on. Mm. For every intended consequence, there are these unintended consequences that need to be dealt with. Maybe you have a game like Urban Shadows where core moves make you create NPCs that you then have to deal you with. Got 50 and motherfuckers think, before you know it. Before you know it, it's an army of NPCs. We're <laughs> Yeah. Yep. 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 I've, I've killed them left and right. Yep. <laughs> so, um, so that whole snowballing events, um, in, in the Beyond the Wall, again, not knowing how I want to share that authority, I really let the characters chill. Absorb, absorb the tone, hang out, fe- feel out their characters, whatnot. And then three sessions later, I realized that in game about eight hours had passed and it was just taking forever. Like it's just, Oh, we did this thing. So we now need to do this thing, which leads to this thing. And now this thing. And it felt like it really dragged on. And so there was a conversation of, Hey, you know, big GM presence here. Can I step in, take over some authority and like, jump ahead like we need some time yeah. to pass yeah and i think it's a good thing to do um i mean even if you're doing a one shot um i think it's really powerful to say that you can have a period of time pass like if there's 15 minutes left in the session say hey i want to see how this wraps up for characters a month from now we're going to take a couple minute break everyone think about what you want that to look like and we'll go around the table because it's really satisfying to let some in-game time pass and breathe and let characters grow and when you have constantly snowballing events and loose threads everywhere you just ha- you have to hit that fast forward button and i think it's really good for i agree 100 percent. the i think you're doing it right when you view your role as a gm as like the director and co-writer of a movie right you are a co-author but you are the director of your movie i think that's really important and i think I have this I have this sense that a lot of people don't like the idea of of like fast forwarding time or like making like cuts and like leaving things you know kind of like abstracting things because we come from this sort of the hobby you know the hobby's origins come from this sort of like simulationist angle right where we want to see everything happen realistically and we want to see you know we want to see like a realistic you know A to Z progression or whatever which means we must experience all of it and um I'm just not sure that's good for storytelling. But. It's, it's boring for storytelling. And when you're doing a podcast be, where yeah. you are um, editing out the boring bits, uh, I don't, I don't care to play that. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, I think, I mean, going back to the hobby like that, when in order to accomplish anything difficult, you must then roll die to see how you succeed to then say, okay, so time passed, you went to the temple, you found stuff. How did that go? Um, it's like, oh, but we didn't roll for that. How do we know it happened? And there are those moments where I think you can have a conversation um, to to take those big steps to paint with big strokes and kind of move past and then come back to the granular stuff when it's exciting. Cool. So this is going to be on Pocket Size Play, yeah? Yes. So I know you guys originally planned on doing 10 uh, episodes of this is that gonna stick like i want to do 10 episodes i know timothy okay. bennett said we should do 40 and i said hell no um <laughs> I <was calling> but... <laughs> timothy out. <laughs> <laughs> sorry dude um but yeah looking at the calendar right now i think that listeners can find the first episode to that up by the end of this month august and then that will probably go on for a few months so they can oh, okay. check in and see how it goes right, cool cool awesome uh is there anything else you want to say about it no nope, i'm good all right, Andrea, I gather you've been playing Fiasco. I have been playing Fiasco. I love Fiasco. And I know I there's too. a lot of people <laughs> who have mixed feelings about Fiasco. My feelings are not mixed. 
I know they aren't, honey, but they're wrong. I don't have, I don't have mixed, I love fiasco. I don't have mixed feelings about it at all. Well, so. <laughs> a lot of the people I've talked to who don't care for fiasco had very, what I would say are bad experiences. Now it's a game. You can play it how you want. If you're having fun, it's not wrong. It's just, I don't like it. <laughs> so when I talk to people and they're like, oh yeah, everyone was just trying to one-up each other and it was so silly and there was no story. I'm like, I can see why you didn't like that game. Now, some people like that. Some people like to play Fiasco that way, and that's that's fine for them. Um, I personally don't care to play it that way. I really feel like those games are boring. They I, can be. They have a shelf yeah, life for sure. right? Exactly. Yeah. After about an hour, you're like, okay. I, I, we play long Fiasco games because this group just sort of does, but... Um, after a little while, you're just, you're done. You're like, okay, I would, I would like something interesting to happen now that isn't just laughing at jokes. So the game I was, we specifically played, um, for those who don't know what Fiasco is. Fiasco is, it's basically about, I I think it's billed as poor impulse control. When you generate characters, you generate, um, it's all random based on die rolls. And you have items that you choose and locations and situations you're all trying to overcome and strive for, and you work them into the story. And usually your characters are at odds with each other about something. And seeing those conflicts actually come to a head, usually it's in the most explosive, most sideways way possible. Because it's you turn over the, the halfway through the game, you have a tilt. And that's when the whole game is supposed to change. Right, uh, yeah, yeah. And also because usually by that point you're out of good dice, which means nobody's going to get a happy ending. Right. So yeah. <laughs> we uh, – the way we always play it with the tilt is you try to incorporate the tilt into future scenes in as many right, scenes yeah. as possible. So if you find – if you overturn like somebody's been keeping a secret that suddenly sees the light of day, everybody's trying to un- uncover each other's secrets and trying to get in these scenes where – that happens and force them as or- organically as possible, which sounds dumb, but it makes sense in the context of Fiasco. So it's it's just a really fun game. I really enjoy it. Um, the playbook or the playset. Yeah, yeah. Which playset did you use? Yeah. We were using Sharknado, which was written. I don't by... know that one. <laughs> I mean, I know what Sharknado is, <laughs> but I didn't know there was a playset of it. <laughs> yeah, it was. It was kind of celebrate the uh, release this week. I had a okay. theme with these games, apparently all based on Hollywood. I don't know. So Sharknado was actually written by um, two very good friends of mine, Bryce Coolen and William Neighbors. It's, oh, cool. There's like a fiasco playset web page you can go on to mm-hmm. and download it for free. And it lovingly pulls in items from all the movies. So they're huge Sharknado fanatics. I saw the first one and said, no, I'm done. I'm good. I will never see this again. But apparently the last couple of movies are just zany and they just – don't even try to make it serious, and it's just fun. The first one about a tornado shark, like a tornado filled with sharks, was not zany. <laughs> well, they okay. So this is like my pet peeve with B movies. Like if they try to make it a serious movie, it's awful. It's painful for everyone. But if they actually just embrace it, and they're like, "This is going to be stupid," and we don't even care because we're having fun. <laughs> right, yeah. I love those B movies. So yeah. the first Sharknado movie was way too serious. Serious. <laughs> I'm, I'm doing air quotes. Serious. <laughs> But the last couple have just been off the wall and hilarious. Um, so, like, they had Sharknado on the moon. Um, I don't know. There's an entire category in the playset that is just chainsaws. Because apparently that's a recurring theme. And I'm okay with that. <laughs> so in spite of, like, all the crazy off-the-wall elements, you can still make a fairly interesting and deep, serious game. Where, yes, there are sharks coming out of Tornado. Yes, I understand that. And you're like a bounty hunter sent to kill sharks. Got it. Fine. But your characters themselves can still be very serious characters. And they're reacting very seriously to this threat and the things that are happening to them. And right, yeah. when they're, you know, when you're in a room and you're like, nope, I'm going to kill this shark. And then your girlfriend comes up and she's like, no, I'm a shark activist. You can't. I won't love you anymore. But then her other boyfriend walks in like that's like that's fun because everything's all of a sudden uncovered at once and you don't know which way to turn. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, is like, I think, you know, I play a lot of the final girl. Right. And the final girl is all about like camp B horror movie 
you know, mm-hmm. settings. That's kind of the idea of it. And I'm going to tell you, I think, like, the end result is, like, cheesy camp over-the-top characters that are just really shallow and dumb and they get killed one by one. But it requires, like, a very serious approach to play to hit it right, you know? Mm-hmm. Like, and it's... um. So I think I think maybe there's something to be said about like expectation setting, you know, before you start playing, you know, like like really talking with the group about like, okay, this is like, you know, I, I want us to have fun and we're going to tell a really, you know, over the top, like, you know, like kind of danger filled, you know, violent story about characters with poor impulse control. But our play doesn't have to be gonzo. That's exactly what I aim for. Yeah, yeah. I, I think I think a lot of it is just going to have to do with you know, like your tables play culture, right? I mean, if you're playing with a group of people who you play with consistently and they kind of know like what everyone's expectations are and you kind you kind of know what you can, what you can push toward, like how much you can go for. Um, I've played in fiasco games where it's gone the, the, the bad way, right? <laughs> the the quote unquote <laughs> bad way, right? Um, where it's just so over the top and so ridiculous that you basically want it to be over, you know, like you have a few laughs, but then like you're, you're kind of over it like pretty fast, you know? We played um, this game a few weeks ago called Sean Bean Quest, which ended up the same way. It ended up the same way. It was so fucking dumb and like ridiculous. And we were burned out halfway through. We were like, I, this has been fun, but I'm done. Like, you know, like yeah. I, I'm done. I can't go anymore. You know, like we've got four more, you know, major acts to do and I'm finished, you know? So I think there's something to be said about like expectation setting and just making sure that everyone's kind of on the same page with how you kind of expect the game to go a little bit so or picking a place that's not inherently goofy too right like salem right. salem 1693 you're not going to get that outcome right <laughs> so <laughs> that's exactly it that's exactly and it was really weird because i've talked to people like rich who have had really bad experiences and i'm like how do you not like fiasco what is wrong with you and then i finally <laughs> had one of those bad experiences and i was like oh oh my gosh i get it i really get it i am so sorry yeah, for you yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's what, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I read both sides of that. I mean, like, I, I, cause you can, Fiasco is the kind of game that can definitely go off the rails, right? My biggest criticism of Fiasco is actually something kind of different, which is you get, you do that setup process, you know, it's, it takes about a good, you know, 20 minutes or so. Um, and maybe, maybe 20 to 30 minutes if you're really discussing it out. You do that whole setup process and you've got this like, you know, you got the cool relationship web, you've got the, you know, your objects and your locations and all that stuff. And then you, you sometimes don't know how to start, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, you, like you, you set it all up and you're like, okay, well now what, <laughs> you know, like it, that's, that's my biggest issue with fiasco is like that first scene, like getting that first scene done. Uh, even now, and I played fiasco a million times, that first scene can still be kind of tricky, you know, but right. Yeah. Right. Well, I'm glad you like fiasco because I love fiasco. And Hearts. There's no, it's it's a uh, it's fun. We don't talk. We actually don't talk about it much. Um, surprisingly, mm-hmm. it's something we have not. We we assume people know what we're talking about, you know, because it's such a popular game, big game. But um, it's fun to talk about Fiasco a little bit. Well, I got a chance uh, to play for the first time Misericord by Emily Kerr Boss. Misericord is a game about this town, this fictional medieval town called Misericord, and the the town has these twelve guilds. Um, brewers, bakers, uh, merchants, um, mages, some, there's a bunch of others. These 12 guilds plus this 13th, uh, gu- like quote unquote guild for like the beggars. Um, and guild life is like what occupies the town. Like that's like the town's main, like life is, is guild life. Um, the game is about people from those guilds telling the stories of the town's past to other members of their guild. And so in gameplay, what you're doing is you're, you're, you're playing out that story that is being told like around the guild hall table, right? Now I'm going to preface this a little bit by saying I didn't read the rules in preparation for the game. Uh, Dan did. So I might be getting some things wrong. So I'm just going strictly based off my memory of playing it. Um, but you start by making some characters uh, for the different guilds. Uh, you, you have like two focus guilds for your session, right? And so you make a few characters for the guilds. You use this really, really very, very fun, um, list of names and epithets, uh, which the, it, the, 
the book is worth picking up for that because it's it's quite enjoyable. Like we had a lot of fun just like playing with the names and the epithets, you know, like, oh, I'm going to play Halfir the Vile or, you know, Merlo the Throne Grinder or whatever, right? Um, there are a lot of weird, strange combinations and, 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 and there's story just in that. You want to know why they're called the Throne Grinder? Like, what does that even mean? Who knows? Um, so you got these names and epithets and that's basically, you know, you make those, those that's, you kind of make some characters and you decide who's a master guildsman, who's an apprentice guildsman and all that stuff. And then you draw some tarot cards. <laughs> okay. So you draw these tarot cards and the tarot cards each have a meaning. And so there's a chart that tells you what the meaning of the tarot cards are. And then you choose a tarot card layout and you having laid out the tarot cards, you then, um, each layout has like certain story elements that you match the tarot cards up with. And then you use that layout. You basically interpret the layout as if you might interpret a tarot card spread, uh, to determine what your story is going to be about. And it's really fun. Okay. It's like, it's really, really neat, fun process. So, um, I just wanted to give an example to, so that listeners have a better understanding of what I'm talking about. So in our second game, we, we can play it like it's really short. So you can play it like two or three times in one session. Our second game, we drew the page, or these are the meanings of the cards. The page, the madman, pregnancy, justice, an impregnable horde, and then detente. Those were like our five cards or six cards. And then we chose a layout that gave us the following. So you plug in the card, the cards to the layout, which the layout doesn't make a lot of sense when you read it, but this is what this is what it sounds like when you read it. Page and madman disagree about pregnancy. The guild's member can take action because of justice. Impregnable horde might be a problem. Detente might just help. That's That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? <laughs> Those, the sentence structures don't mean much. But what you do is you then interpret that to give you the start of your story. And it's really, really fun because you do it as a group. And uh, the conversations you have from it are quite enjoyable. So what we ended up with on that one was we had some named characters that we matched up with the various named character or the various characters in the layout. Simona has had a child with either with either Ivanus or Melchior. Her husband, the Lord, will execute the father of the child. Simona, to protect the baby and the identity of the father, has sealed herself away in an inner vault. Orkina has been called upon to help penetrate the vault. Orkina was from the Carpenters Guild, so um, it was fun. It, it's a neat like that. It's you have this really neat like way of starting your story. It reminded us a lot of In a Wicked Age and drawing the oracles, you know, mm-hmm. to try to figure out what your story is going to be about. This has a really really similar vibe, and I quite liked it. Um, so then, once gameplay starts, once you start telling the story, it it all revolves around questions, and it's a little bit like A Thousand and One Nights um, in some ways. And I think she even took some direct inspiration from that game that by Meg Baker. Um, the GM gets to ask questions of the players regarding the environment and the world. Uh, I was very comfortable with that because that's something I do anyway when I'm GMing a, GMing a game, and I GMed the second one that we did. And then the players ask the GM questions about the story itself. So um, when they ask the GM the, the questions about the story itself, it's it's sort of along the lines of, will Melchior try to break out of prison Will Ivanis express his love to Simona and so forth? Uh, the GM responds with what's basically yes, no, or let's play to find out, right? Um, the, the back and forth, uh, the style of play, which I kind of jokingly call the Socratic method style of play. That's because I'm a lawyer. Um, <laughs> it's really neat. Like it's, it creates this really nice, like back and forth dynamic at the table and the discussions that arise from the questions, like really, really make the story quite um, just really enjoyable and rich. Anyway, you play out, you play out to the story's done. You do, you have several different types of epilogues that you can do like several, several different epilogue procedures. You do all that. Um, and then your story's over. And if you have time, you play, an, you play another one. Really liked it. Apart from the really cool, like, sort of story creation aspects of it, the game is also very brief, which is nice. You can kind of fit several stories into one session. And um, the the thing that I think is going to be really interesting about Misericord, uh, which we didn't have time to really explore too much, is the game is clearly designed to be played over a long period of time or over multiple sessions, right? Because what you do is you can start to, you keep all your characters from your previous stories and you keep track of like your different like guilds and the characters in them. And you can start to assign uh, specific tarot cards to certain characters in your, um, like sort of in your collection and your little ongoing tale. And so 
basically the next time you play, you kind of can bring some of those characters back in and kind of see more of their story um, while also creating new stories and looking at different guilds. And it's pretty obvious just from a, from just playing at once that her intention is that you play this for a while and really develop this like complex, rich, like town of misericord. And, um, I think that's pretty neat. I don't, I don't, you know, the way we schedule games is not going to probably make it possible for me to, to explore this much, but, um, it was, it was pretty cool. I was really, really, really happy with it. I thought it was a neat game. What, what drew me to the game when I first heard Emily talk about it is she described it as a, um, a real dinner party game where you have some friends over that don't need to be gamers. You have a big meal and lots of wine, and then you just play this for a couple hours. And then you have such a good time that those friends come back in a month and you, you open up the notebook again yep, and you do it, again. You do it yep. and it's, and it's, it's <laughs> meant to be played over wine and cheese and dessert. And you just, you tell the stories together and, um, you know, so it could be an introductory game for people who aren't necessarily gamers. And it just sounded like such a fun conversation over food. And I'll mention again, wine. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we were playing, we were playing over hangouts, but you can tell that. Yeah. I, I remember, I remember her, you know, that, that, that conversation with her and, um, just from playing the game, like you can immediately tell like what her goals are, like her long-term goals for the game are. And, um, and I really like it because it's a medieval and inv- it's a medieval setting. Uh, and it has like a really, 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 really like low grade assumption of magic, I think. Um, but you're otherwise just kind of telling like stories that maybe you don't often get to tell in like a low fantasy game or in a medieval setting, you know? Um, and I, I, I thought it was really good. Also, I thought it was a slight improvement on A Thousand and One Nights. Um, it, ha- it shares a similar storytelling mechanic as A Thousand and One Nights, but I think it was a slight improvement over A Thousand and One Nights because the questioning of, of the table, like the questions you pose about the characters, does not have, it's not tied to any dice or any mechanics. And I've always thought that little die the little the dice aspect of thousand one nights is a little it's not bad it's just a little like it's kind of something you have to deal with you know and um and i like that it kind of gets out of the way in this game and you can kind of just focus on the questions and the answers um it's it good stuff misericord's pretty pretty badass i like it a lot uh and that's all i gotta say about it let's move on to giving me life All right, it's giving me life. Uh, Rich, what's giving you life? August, for the past couple of years, has had a thing called RPG a Day. Uh, this year, the RPG Brigade seems to have taken up the mantle. And what it is, a little prompt for a thing you can talk about. Uh, some people are doing YouTube episodes. Other people are posting on Google+. Plus. I create a little collection for it so people can opt out if they don't care. I like it because each question, while it's very oriented around the mindset of, hey, you've got a gaming group and you normally play a particular game. (laughs) So there are certain uh, aspects of the questions where I'm like, okay, how do I answer this? I thought thought the same thing. I was like, how the fuck would I even answer that? I don't even know to begin. (laughs) Character moment you're proudest of? Like, uh... (laughs) (laughs) Most impressive thing another characters did... I don't know. Uh, what story does your group, your group, singular, tell about your character, singular? So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just answering it's it to the for best a slightly of- different segment of the hobby. That's okay. It is. And I'm, I'm not slamming on that because I totally was, I, that's how I played too. It's just an interesting challenge. And I've had fun. I'm, you know, here we are recording on day eight. I've answered every one of the eight days. My plan is to finish out the month. I'm following the, um, you know, people are, oh shoot, who's the, the hash marking? The, 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 what is hashtag. that called? Hashtag. hashtag. Wow. I'm <laughs> old. Working. I'm You're like, so old. It's, it's called hash brown. I'm embarrassed for you. Browns. I'm following the hash browns of everyone. Hail Satan. Yes. <laughs> The RPG a day hash browns. Um, it, following that, re- reading other people's answers, even watching a couple of the YouTube videos, and it's fun. It's neat to listen to people geek out about their slice of fun. I like RPG a day. It's it's pretty cool. Cool, awesome, Tim. What's giving you life? I've been reading a manga called 
Dungeon Meshi or a Delicious in Dungeon. So it's about these fantasy uh, explorers, uh, dungeoneers, for lack of a better word. They are stuck in a dungeon and broke, and they start eating and cooking monsters. <laughs> so it goes into extravagant detail in the preparation of these monsters. For example, the walking mushroom, the way in which you slice it and the stem, how that's different from the cap. And then the type of dish you use it in, it was in a hot pot with certain other ingredients. It becomes like a cooking comic about fantasy creatures in a very like D and D like environment. It's it's kind of torchbearer. Kind of <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it's it's like torchbearer meets Julia Child, but a Japanese comic. I'm loving it, and it's giving me life. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That's neat. That's pretty strange. I'm into it. <laughs> Andrea, what's giving you life? Simon's Cat. Uh, Simon's Cat is a series on YouTube about a cat. Yes, I watch cat videos. Oh, me too. I'm right there with you. Oh, they're so cute. And it's these cute little, they're usually fairly monochromatic. There's not too much color in them. There's a little bit here and there. But it's just a cat getting into trouble and just being the bane of his owner's existence. And they are so cute. (laughs) I had never heard of Simon's Cat, but I am am furiously mentally bookmarking that so I can go watch it with my partner. You will enjoy them. The cat videos. Yeah. Cool. It's animated. Just, yeah. Right? Oh, it's yeah. animated. It's oh, not yeah, real? It's anim- oh, yeah, it's animated. No, not oh. real cats. No. Oh. Sorry. Sorry oh, okay. to let you down. That's but okay. it's still really no, cute. No, I'll still, go, I'll still go look at it. Um, I love... Um, it's an old one, but I love Maru. You know Maru? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's my favorite. I, that cat has the best comic timing of, like, any... <laughs> of any, like, animal or human comedian. Like, he's so good. Um, awesome. Cool. Simon's Cat. We'll include a link in the show notes so people can go check that out. And the thing giving me life, I've been I've been warned by my co-hosts um, not to go into too much detail, but uh, I like uh, lately uh, Stranger Things. Um, this is the now, despite the fact that I normally would not have watched Stranger Things until about two or three years from now, um, I decided to go ahead and watch it while it's popular and a thing, and uh, <laughs> it's and it's worth it. It's totally worth it. It's so good. Um, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do any spoilers because we have people on the show who have not yet heard it. And I'm sure their listeners have not yet heard or watched it rather who have not yet seen it. I said this once in G plus and it's true. It's likely took every fucking thing I love and made it into a single TV show. I swear to God, like it's got synth wave. It's got beautiful fonts and typefaces. Like I just, uh, like I just paused it once and I was just like looking at the typefaces and like, and I was Googling like what the names of the typefaces were because I was like, these are so good. Um, it's got, it's it's kids on bikes. That's like one of my favorite movie like genre. Like my movie genres is <laughs> is is kids on bikes. I love that. Um it's got a little bit of X Files. It's got a little bit of um Monster of the Week. It is it is a Monster of the Week story. Um you can map out every character to a Monster of the Week playbook. It's cool. Stranger Things. Um I'm done with it and I was really bummed out. It was one of those like it was a total like oh, fuck, I wish there was like more episodes, so I guess I have to wait. Um, I can't wait for it to come back. I'm curious to see what they're going to do. And that's our show. If you'd like to get in touch with us, I recommend going to our website, gauntlet-rpg. On that website, you will find links to our G Plus community, which is a great place to get in touch with us, as well as uh, our various meetups if you'd like to play some games with us. Uh, and our other podcasts, such as Plus One Forward, Discern Realities, and Pocket Sized Play. Uh, we are also on Twitter at Gauntlet RPG. And where can we find you guys this week? Tim? Twitter.com slash pocket sized play. Awesome. Rich? Twitter.com O R K L O R D. Okay, very good. And uh, Andrea? So I have a Twitter account, but I don't like Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> so fine. you're gonna get my tumblr <laughs> yeah your tumblr Ivory, yeah what is it ivorythorns.tumblr.com awesome uh oh uh, jason don't forget codex you can find that on gauntlet-rpg.com right yeah <laughs> guys thank you so much thank you thank you thank you so much and listeners thanks for listening
Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, I got a chance to uh, play Dungeon World because I never get a chance to do that. Um, and uh, that's a joke. I, I get lots of chances. <laughs> 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 Sorry. I mean, I'll, I'll try to telegraph that better next time. Cue laughter. 